So today is a really exciting day as it marks the release of Critical Role called The Nether Deep, the most recent official adventure released by Wizards of the Coast for D&D 5th Edition. You might already be aware that some of the Critical Role content isn't always officially released, uh, such as the recent Taldori Campaign Guide Reborn, but you know, if this is the kind of thing that matters to you, you should know that this is officially released by Wizards of the Coast. I'm also currently running a giveaway for two copies of Critical Role called The Nether Deep, so you'll have until the end of the day to enter, so be sure to check out the link in the description so you don't miss out on that. One of my favorite things to do whenever we get a new book release is to take a look at all the new magical items that have been included. I love to see all the new toys that we're going to get to play with and kind of think of different ways that they might be able to be used. So that is exactly what we are going to be doing in today's video. But before that, I have briefly skimmed through some of the adventure content. It does look like a really, really kind of different and really unique adventure. So it's something I'm excited to take a much deeper look into at some point and release a full on review a little bit later on. But I think one of the beauties of this whole adventure book is that it doesn't really matter whether or not you're invested in the Critical Role series at all. You can very easily kind of pick this up and sort of drop it into your own world, or your own campaign setting with really minimal effort. And I think it's, it's really a testament to the work that, uh, that was put into the book to really allow for that kind of thing. So, so I do think it's something that's probably worth picking up regardless of whether or not you actually follow Critical Role or not. But with all that out of the way now, let's take a look at some of the magical items. So before we get into all the descriptions of magical items, there's something that you need to know before that. Uh, this adventure introduces the concept of something known as Ruidium, which is something of, a, of an element that is able to derive some magical power from it, but it also has the ability to corrupt. Uh, some items will be affected by it, and even people can also be affected by it. So it's definitely something to be aware of, and something you will see as a recurring theme as we explore the items uh, down below. All right, so let's take a look here. So it starts out with Ruidium items. Ruidium is linked to the Apotheon, channeling not just Elixian's distorted emotions, but also the curse of misfortune bestowed upon him by the Ruidius. Though it is a source of magical power, Ruidium corrupts everything that it touches. Even magical items can be corrupted by Ruidium, and using such items comes with a risk. Weapons and armor can be transformed into Ruidium items by infusing them with powdered Ruidium, which gives, them a, which gives the item a rusty red coloration. Other items can be transformed into Ruidium items after prolonged contact with the mineral. Such, uh, such items have Ruidium crystals uh, embedded in them or, or veins of Ruidium running through them. So this here just gives you a quick uh, explanation of what exactly Ruidium is and the ways that it can sort of impact and affect items. And again, you'll see a lot more details of that uh, down below. So the first item to take a look at is the Breathing Bubble. It is a common, wondrous item. This translucent, bubble-like sphere has a slightly tacky outer surface. The bubble contains one hour of breathable air. The bubble regains all its expended air daily at dawn. You gain the item's benefits by wearing it over your head like a helmet. When it's not being worn, the Breathing Bubble retains its bubble shape. So something that is a very common theme throughout this campaign, there's a lot of underwater exploration, which is actually something that's kind of cool because it's not really something that gets a lot of exploration in, in a lot of the other campaign guides or adventures, so, uh, or adventures. So this is a really, really kind of an interesting way at, at exploring that. So just something that you can simply slot over your head to be able to give you the ability to breathe underwater for a limited period of time. So even if you don't have access to spells like water, water breathing or some of the other plethora of ways that you can do it here, this is just kind of a simple and, and fun way to do it. Next up is the Earring of Message. It is another common wondrous item. Uh, the blue crystal of the earring is wrapped in a delicate copper wire. The earring has five charges. While wearing it, you can use one action to expend one charge to cast the message spell. The earring regains 1d4 expended daily charges at dawn. Uh, if you are a fan of Critical Role and you've seen the first campaign, you're probably very familiar with the earrings of message, and I think on more than one occasion we saw sometimes where Matt probably regretted actually giving this item to the, to the players, but uh, this does seem to be a slightly uh, toned down version of it, so it's probably better to see that. But honestly, overall, I actually love the, the creation of this item, the insertion of it, because uh, message is such a powerful spell, and only being a cantrip, it can often be really overlooked because it's not flashy, it doesn't really do anything extravagant, but there's so much utility here that, that I love that it's sort of just combined and created within this item. I think it's a great addition. So next up is the Jewel of Three Prayers. This is a legendary wondrous item that also does require attunement. The Jewel of Three Prayers is a vestige of divergence. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with vestiges of divergence, uh, this is another concept which has been created within Critical Role. Uh, it's the idea that these items and weapons and different things that you can acquire sort of grow with your character uh, to kind of increase in power as you sort of develop as, as a person or even throughout your adventuring career. In ancient times, Elixir and the Apotheon bore this amulet as a symbol of his covenant with the three prime deities, Sainine the Moon Weaver, Avandra the Changebringer, and Coralon the Arch Heart. When the jewel is found, only Sainine's power, uh, power thrums within its dormant heart. The power of the other two deities waits to be reawakened by a hero or heroes 
who can follow the Elixian's footsteps. So again, if you are unfamiliar with the process, there are three states to every uh, vestige of divergence. There is the dormant state, the awakened state, and the exalted state. So they, again, these will happen over time as your characters kind of progress, uh, become better people maybe, or just throughout their adventure career in general. So we'll start out with the first one, which is the dormant state. So in this state, the Jewel of Three Prayers is a glittering golden disc attached to a fine golden chain. The chain magically resizes to function as a necklace for the creature that wears it. In its dormant state, the jewel has the following properties. You gain a plus one bonus to AC. Uh, while wearing, uh, wearing or holding the jewel, you can use one action to cause it to shed bright light in a 15-foot radius uh, or dim light for an additional 15 feet. The light lasts until you extinguish it, no action required. The jewel has three charges and regains all its expended, expended daily charges at dawn. While holding the jewel, you can expend one charge to cast the invisibility spell. So there's a lot of utility even just from the initial dormant state. Just alone getting the plus one to AC is huge because you can stack that with so many other, other ways of gaining armor. So if you're a blade singing wizard or a cleric, there's so many ways that you can use this to your advantage to be able uh, to, to acquire so much more armor class. So next up is the Awakened State. In this state, the Jewel has received the blessing of Avandra, the Changebringer. Three delicate spires unfurl from the Jewel Center, like buds of flowers opening in the spring. Three lapis lazuli stones rest in the, uh, the dew drops of these spires. The following benefits of the Jewel improve. The bonus of, that the Jewel confers to your AC increases to plus two. Its number of charges uh, in relation to casting invisibility increases to five. So again, you can already see there's so much, uh, so much potential utility here and we haven't even got to the bonus things that it adds. The jewel gains the following additional properties, which you can use while wearing or holding it. You can expend one of the jewel's charges, no action required uh, to end one of the following conditions on yourself, grappled, paralyzed, or restrained. That alone can be really clutch. Um, when another creature you can see within 60 feet of you fails a saving throw, you can expend one, one of the jewel's charges as a reaction to enable that creature to re-roll the saving throw, potentially, potentially turning a failure into a success. The creature must use the new roll. Importantly though, it does actually require the, the person you're using it on to have failed the saving throws. So you're unlikely to really use this on an enemy to sort of impose a retroactive disadvantage in much of the way you might with you know, something like Silvery Barbs, but uh, that's for another discussion. Uh, and finally, we have the Exalted State. In this state, the Jewel has received the blessing of Coraline the Arch Heart. Uh, a gleaming emerald surrounds, surrounded by a halo of gold appears on the Jewel. The following benefits of the Jewel improved. Your AC increases to plus three, and the number of charges increases to plus seven. The Jewel gains the following additional properties, which you can use while wearing or holding it. You gain the ability to breathe water, and you gain a swimming speed equal to your walking speed. Each of your allies within 30 feet of you gains the ability to breathe water and gains a swimming speed equal to their walking speed. As a bonus action, you can expend one of the jewel's charges to target yourself or one willing creature you can see within 15 feet of yourself. That target teleports to an unoccupied space of your choice within 15 feet of yourself, along with any equipment the target is wearing or carrying. The target appears in a flash of golden radiance, and each creature of your choice within 5 feet of the target's new location must make a DC 18 constitution saving throw. On a failed save, the creature takes 4d10 radiant damage and is blinded until the start of your next turn. On a successful save, the creature takes half damage and isn't blinded. The last feature is honestly really cool. You can just sort of force uh, one of your allies. You can, you can, uh, you know, if they're in a dangerous situation, or you have, you know, your your party's wizard or spellcaster is in a, you know, in a really tight spot, you can actually teleport them away from uh, from where they are into, uh, you know, some space around you to potentially keep them safe, and then they can do additional damage as they just sort of pop in. The the radiant glow kind of explodes, and they can deal damage to nearby enemies and even potentially blinding them. So honestly, that alone is a huge benefit on top of all the other stuff that you get, being you know, getting a plus three to AC, being able to cast invisibility. Honestly, the Jewel of Three Prayers is, is a huge, huge item. So next up is a whole classification of items that fall under uh, the category of being a metal. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how these come from. I haven't read too much into detail into the adventure as of yet, but there seems to be quite a lot of them, but they're all relatively simple, so we can we can kind of get through these pretty quickly. So, so the first up is the Metal of Muscle. This is a common wondrous item. Uh, you can squeeze the metal tightly in your palm of your hand as an action. Doing so gives you advantage on strength checks and strength saving throws for one hour. Once this property has been used, it can't be used again, and the metal becomes non-magical. So that is something that is consistent that you'll see across all of these metals. Uh, they all, once they are used, they all become non-magical. So these are single-use items that have some form of utility that you might be able to sort of pass on to your party. They could sort of find these as relics maybe throughout as they're adventuring, but these are really simple items you can kind of just sort of hand to them and they can hold on for really, really clutch situations. Uh, next up is the Medal of the Conch. 
Uh, when you use an action to rub the metal, you gain a swimming speed equal to your walking speed for one hour. And again, once it's used, you, it becomes not magical. Next is the Medal of the Horizon back. Uh, when you would be hit by an attack, you can use your reaction to increase your AC by five until the start of your next turn, including against the triggering attack. You must be wearing the medal uh, and be able to see the creature that made the trigger attack to use this property. Essentially, it's giving you a one-time cast of shield, which honestly is really pretty good. <laughs> Uh, next is Metal of the Maze. When you use an action to trace the maze inscribed on this metal, you gain advantage on wisdom checks and you know the quickest route to the end of any non-magical path or maze for one hour. That can be pretty useful in very, very niche situations, but uh, it's, it's kind of fun. Next is Metal of the Meat Pie. Uh, you gain 2d4 plus 2 temporary hit points when you use an action to press the metal into your mouth. Once this property has been used, it can't be used again, and the, and the metal becomes not magical. While magical, the metal is slightly warm to the touch, as if as if it's fresh from the oven, and smells uh, faintly of bakery pie crust. So you get a little bit of nice flavor there. I kind of like that. Next is metal of the wetlands. Uh, when you use an action to trace the edge of the metal, uh, difficult terrain doesn't cost you extra movement for one hour. Again, pretty useful in you know, very specific situations if you're like trudging through a swamp or something like that. And lastly of the medals is the Medal of Wit. Uh, you can press the medal to your temple as an action. Doing so gives you advantage on intelligence checks and intelligence saving throws for one hour. So again, all in all, the medals are pretty cool, pretty useful utility items that you know you can probably give quite a number of them to your party out. They might be able to find them at shops for relatively uh, relatively low gold cost, uh, and it's just kind of a fun little addition to give them some some simple little bonuses that you know they can find useful. Next up is the Ring of Red Fury. Now, this is going to be the first item that we actually see uh, kind of being affected by Ruidium in some capacity. So this is a very rare ring which requires attunement. Uh, the ring has a stripe of Ruidium running through it. While wearing the ring, you gain the following benefits. You can breathe water, and you gain a swimming speed equal to your walking speed. There's a feature called Ruidium Rage. As a bonus action, you can use the ring to gain the following benefits, which last for one minute or until you're incapacitated. You have advantage on strength checks and strength saving throws. When you hit with an attack, you can add your proficiency bonus to the damage roll, and difficult terrain does not cost you extra movement, and you are immune to the paralyzed and restrained conditions. You can't use this property of the ring again until you finish a long rest. Overall, these are pretty huge uh, kind of advantages, advantages to be able to even get in the first place. Uh, just simply being immune to paralyzed and restrained can be uh, really helpful, especially considering some of the some of the monsters that are included in this uh, in this campaign. Um, no spoilers, but uh, that can definitely come in handy. So down here, you can also see some of these secondary effects here. So uh, Ruidium Corruption is something that can that can occur to a character as they use these items if they fail to save. Uh, and on top of getting a level of exhaustion, they actually uh, there is some sort of material change uh, to their actual form uh, as the corruption intensifies. It's really important to note that uh, Ruidium Corruption is not removed when the level of exhaustion removes. We have the examples of what they look like here. So as you gain your first level of exhaustion through it, it says a red rash appears, originating from the point of contact with the Ruidium. At the second level of exhaustion, it says pulsing crimson veins spread across the creature's skin. And you can see that they get progressively worse over time, uh, ultimately ending in the corruption killing the creature. Now, as I said before, as the exhaustion levels decrease, so even if you fully rest uh, and you have no more levels of exhaustion, if you were at the second level here where the, uh, the, the pulsing crimson veins spread across the creature's skin, those stay. So unless you're able to uh, remove the corruption, which can only be done through that of a wish spell, um, this kind of gives your characters a little bit of a ticking clock. So you really need to be careful when you're using these items. Lastly, it does say if Ruidium is destroyed. If the Apotheon is killed or redeemed, all the Ru Ruidium in Exandria is destroyed instantly, and the Ring of Red Fury becomes a Ring of Free Action. So that is obviously part of the adventure itself. Uh, we can kind of take one of those two paths, and if that does happen, the, the, the properties of the ring will change, uh, and it, it sort of changes into a different kind of an item. Next up, we have Ruidium Armor, which is a very rare form of armor. It also does require attunement. Uh, the Magic Armor has a dull, rusty color and has veins of Ruidium running through it. While you wear this armor, you gain the following benefits. You have resistance to psychic damage, you can breathe water, and you gain a swimming speed equal to your walking speed. So again, as I said, there's a lot of ways that you can gain, uh, you can be able to breathe water and gain a swimming speed uh, throughout this adventure, but having resistance to psychic damage is a pretty big deal. 
Um, as for the Ruidium Corruption on this one, it says when you roll a 1 on a saving throw while wearing this armor, you must make a DC 15 Charisma saving throw. On a failed save, you gain 1 level of exhaustion. If you are not already suffering from Ruidium Corruption, you become corrupted when you fail to save. So again, this is referring back to that sort of increasing scale of the, the Ruidium Corruption. And if the uh, Ruidium is destroyed, uh, this becomes just a generic plus 1 armor. Next up is the Ruidium Shield, another very rare item requiring attunement. Uh, tendrils of Ruidium extend across the metal surface of the shield. When the shield is on your person, you gain the following benefits. You have resistance to psychic damage, you can breathe water, and you gain a swimming speed equal to your walking speed. So once again, pretty much exactly the same as the, the, the previous item, as the armor, but just in, in a shield form. Uh, it has a feature called Psychic Reflection. When you take psychic damage while holding the shield, you can use your reaction to choose another creature you can see within 30 feet of you. That creature takes the psychic damage that you would have taken. So that is a pretty huge benefit. Uh, you can sort of reflect that onto an enemy, and it's not even that you take half and they take half, you're not splitting damage here, they just take any amount of psychic damage that you would have taken. So, uh, considering the fact that there are a number of features that are able to, to inflict psychic damage throughout this adventure, that can, again, can be a pretty huge deal. As for the corruption, it says when you use the shield's uh, psychic reflection property, you must make a DC 20 charisma saving throw on a failed save. You gain the level of exhaustion, similar to all the previous ones that we had seen before. So you got to be pretty consistent and pretty competent in your charisma saves uh, to be able to consistently use these. So I guess that's sort of how they they sort of explain the trade-off between these incredibly power, powerful features, but there is you know, a really, really high risk of something very negative happening to your character. And if Iridium is destroyed, this again just becomes a generic plus two shield, which honestly is still pretty good on its own. Next is the Ruidium weapon. Again, it can be any weapon. Uh, it is very rare and also requires attunement. Uh, you gain the same benefits. You can breathe underwater and you gain a swimming speed equal to your walking speed. It also has a feature called Ruidium Strike. A creature you hit with this weapon takes an extra 2d6 psychic damage. As for the corruption, when you roll a 1 on an attack roll made with this weapon, you must make a dc20 charisma saving throw. And again, increasing your level of Ruidium Corruption. So that's a, that's a pretty big deal. Uh, it really, really makes those, uh, those natural ones hurt a whole lot more. And then again, if Ruidium is destroyed, this just becomes a standard plus 2 weapon. And then the final item that we have is the Teleportation Tablet. This is another rare wondrous item. Uh, it says this clay tablet is 8 inches long, 4 inches wide, and half an inch thick. Uh, inscribed on it is the sigil of a sequence from a permanent teleportation circle. A creature that studies the sequence for 10 minutes can make a DC 21 intelligence arcana check, learning the circle's destination on a success. You can use an action to break the tablet in half, turning it to dust. If the tablet is broken while it is on the same plane of existence as the teleportation circle, uh, whose sigil sequence is engraved on it, a 10-foot diameter teleportation circle of glowing blue light appears on the ground in an unoccupied space you can choose within 30 feet of you. The teleportation circle has the characteristics of one created using the teleportation circle spell, except that it connects to the teleportation circle whose sigil sequence appears on the tablet. The teleportation circle is created, created by the tablet and disappears at the end end of your next turn. So this can be a really uh, useful sort of campaign mechanic that can allow your characters to get somewhere they need to be, um, and it can be a very effective uh, way of sort of doing that. So that's been a quick look at the, the new magical items that were included in Critical Role called the Nether Deep. Once again, don't forget to enter the giveaway you have until the end of today to win, uh, but otherwise, until the next one, take care.